All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we were given it another minute or two. We had, I guess, some people had issues logging on, but I think we are in pretty good shape right now. So we are going to get started this morning. So I am Shannon McInerney. I am the product manager at Midwest Ground Covers, and we are really excited to put on this webinar for you today about the design and intent of the Midwest Native Gardens. Um, so first, we're going to go through some housekeeping things just so you guys know, you know, what the plan is. This is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. Um, so please, if, um, if you have any questions of any type, we're going to be using the Q&A today. So please put your questions in there. And um, we're going to take all the questions or answer all the questions at the end of the webinar. But if you think of something during, just pop it in and then we'll work through the list of questions at the end. Um, of an email will be sent at the end of this webinar um, with um, some information about ASLA, LA's uh, CES credits. So if you are a landscape architect looking to get CEUs for this today, look for that email after the presentation. There will be a quiz there and, that you'll need to take within 24 hours. So keep an eye out for that. Also, this webinar is being recorded and we will post it to our website um, within the next you know, week or two, hopefully. So um, if you, you know, have to jump off early or something like that, or just wanna watch it again, it, it will be out there for you to watch it later on. So I am um, happy to introduce our panelists today. So these are, these are the, the force behind these new gardens that were created last year. So first is, Austin Eyshide, who is the owner of Austin Eyshide Garden Design in Chicago. And he focuses on naturalistic planting design for all types of landscapes, commercial, residential, public spaces. And he um, has worked on projects with contractors and designers and landscape architects all over the United States. Um, he's, he's done a lot of, um, you know, studying in Europe uh, with, with Pete Adolf and the likes. Um, so he has been working with us at Midwest for the last three years and had designed several gardens in St. Charles. So um, we were happy to have him work on this one at the Natural Garden. Our second panelist is Jens Jensen, who is the owner of Jensen Ecology, which is based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he works on uh, restor ecological restoration projects and management throughout the Midwest, uh, ranging from sizes of less than an acre to thousands of acres. Um, kind of works through the whole process, so from design, permitting, you know, all the way implementation up, up through the management. And he has been working with Midwest Ground Covers for the last five years at our natural garden facility on ecological rest restoration, work in the bioswales and prairie and wetland restoration. So what kind of led us here um, or, or led us to, to work on this project is at the end of 2019, um, Krista Orm Keller, the owner of Midwest Ground Covers, decided she wanted to renovate um, some of the gardens we have at the Midwest Natural Garden. And um, so she asked Jens and Austin to collaborate, seeing as how we had a working relationship with both of them. Um, she thought it would be good if they could work together and kind of take their strengths and collaborate and create these new gardens for us. So some of the qualifications were that we wanted to use all native species, um, primarily local ecotype. You know, most of the stuff that we, we grow at Midwest Ground Covers is NGN or natural garden natives as, as we call it, which is local ecotype within 90 miles of St. Charles. Um, so to the best of our abilities, we wanted to use local ecotype plants and we wanted to demonstrate different scales. So, um, you know, they'll kind of explain that in, in the presentation. Um, important was that the aesthetics were the forefront, that it wasn't a, a typical native composition that you'd see, but to look really like a designed landscape, like you'd see, um, you know, using not native material. So all that being said, I will kick it off to Jens and we'll get going this morning. Good morning. Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so why, you know, why do we use native plants? I think this will be probably apparent to a lot of people on the webinar, just knowing kind of the audience, but just some basics here. You know, native plants are you know adapted to the local climate, so they're much more resilient and can um, 
can take on, you know, adverse weather and, and, and changing climate conditions, uh, they will reproduce on their own. So these are uh, fertile species that that will cross pollinate and 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 not not necessarily cross pollinate, but reproduce on their own, kind of fill in areas. So much more kind of long lived landscapes typically. Now, obviously, like the look of those landscapes can change over time, which we'll get into more. Uh, great for pollinators because they are uh, native plants, and especially with a local ecotype, the the the, the local pollinators should be kind of familiar to them. Um, and just, you know, the, the overall diversity of the plant palette, um, which kind of ties into the resiliency of the landscape is that, you know, if a disease or a pest were to come through the landscape, uh, they would be much more resilient to that because of the genetic diversity built in, similar to if you have, you know, a street, uh, you know, just a bunch of ash trees on your street, emerald ash borer comes in, well, it takes, off, takes out every tree as opposed to having kind of a, a diverse uh, palette of, of, of trees. Um, they are lower maintenance typically. Now, you know, they do require maintenance and we don't like the impression that uh, there's nothing to be done with these landscapes, but they are typically lower maintenance, less inputs, no fertilizer, typically not putting uh, soil amendments or topsoil or things like that down, just adapting the plants to what soils you're working with. Um, and uh, another item is, you know, erosion control, kind of stormwater capture, you know, the deep rooted plants, opening up the soil. Um, Things like that, it can definitely help. And, and there, there, there's a lot of that that, that we do at at, uh, at Natural Garden, um, not necessarily on, this, on, on these gardens, but some other things we do. And then um, another thing, kind of with the less inputs, is you know really they're they're not needed to be irrigated following uh, following the initial establishment. So it's kind of some basics there um, as to why we would use natives again. Uh, so, so the vision um, here, and um, Shannon sort of talked about this a little bit, um, is to use for these gardens to use local e ecotypes, mostly that Midwest um, produces at National Garden. Um, we wanted to kind of showcase these species in a scalable way, and what we mean by that is, you know, on on a larger scale, on a larger site, if you have 40, 80 acres or something, you know, you could use and you probably would use more aggressive species for wetland or kind of prairie restoration because you need those to suppress invasives, but those can be a little unwieldy on a smaller scale. So we wanted to kind of select species on small, smaller scales that would be more kind of in the landscape kind of garden setting where they wouldn't be kind of looking wild or, or, un, or unwieldy because I think that's that can be sort of a turn, turn off to, to certain people, um, you know, a small quarter acre plot in front of someone's house that's it's like a giant, you know, 12 foot prairie. Um, so, and, and aesthetics being at the forefront here and kind of manageable combinations. Um, and we'll go more into that uh, when we get into the details. Perfect. Hello everybody and thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, so like Shannon said, the gardens, um, we kind of broke, um, before we got there, they, we kind of used the existing stamp where the gardens were. So if you'd already been there, um, you can kind of have an idea where they are. And they kind of were, it was primarily spirobolus, like 90% spirobolus. So we went through and edited some of that out and then um, kept it in some of the gardens and then removed it in the other ones that we didn't use it as a combination. And um, it was broken down into three different scales. We wanted to do residential to make it more digestible for people to understand a smaller scale because we see these expansive gardens in public space and in nature. And it's hard to um, really kind of figure out how to use these plants in um, you know, our clients' yards um, for smaller areas. Um, and then medium scales, mid-size and um, one of the mid-size, we have taller plants, you know, so somebody more adventurous people that like the taller plants and a couple, you know, like three to four foot um, at height and just a little bit larger. And the residential scale is a few hundred square feet and the mid-size scale is, can be from like a thousand to two thousand square feet. And then the corporate campus is those larger um, campuses that, um, landscape architects, contractors are designing, and you can use these stamps that we created and use them on a large scale. And so we've kind of shown you how to use plants in different quantities for these different scales. And, um, and then we also have two shade gardens that we created. So.
um, some of the challenges and opportunities here. Um, and I guess the first bullet point kind of using all natives and landscape design, that was probably more of a challenge for Austin because he's not as used to it as I am being more of a garden designer. Um, I typically use all native. So for me, it was familiar, but I think kind of that working with him and I'm, I'm, I'm more of definitely an, an aesthetic driven um, process. Um, but I think working with natives on the small scale and kind of considering composition is, is sort of tough because you want to get, um, at least me as kind of a restoration ecologist, you, you always sort of lean towards more and more diversity. But I mean, I think on a smaller scale, you really have to pare it down and think about groupings. And Austin was really good at kind of steering us back into that and, and then thinking more about the scalability of it. Um, you know, where we're trying to sort of emulate maybe how plants would exist in the wild to some extent you don't have quite that opportunity to do it on a smaller scale. So you have to think about, well, maybe that doesn't totally drive, drive the process because really like these, these sites, where, where, whether we're talking about small scale or medium or large scale, or even a very large scale, you know, aesthetics still have to drive it so we can better promote these, these, these types of projects, which are good for conservation and all the other reasons we talk about with native plants. Um, and the design and flow of the gardens is very important. That was a very good, um, opportunity to work with Austin on that because he's much more experienced in that area. And so sort of we we propose plant combinations, but then think about, well, how is that going to look together? And and, and 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 would those kind of, you know, bull, you know would, would certain plants kind of crowd each other out and kind of take 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 all that into consideration? Yeah, so like Jen said, it was definitely a challenge for me when Krista brought it up. I was like, you know, apprehensive right away. And then, you know, talking about working with gens, I felt a little more comfortable. And I definitely in my practice, I like to use, you know, 60% native, 40% non-native, you know, plus or minus. And I just think there's room for everybody. And I like to use plants that, you know, definitely are, you know, not going to be invasive. And, um, you know, there's plants out there, you know, European natives or um, Asian natives that are, you know, fulfill a purpose and the aesthetic of the design and kind of fill a niche and maybe a season that it's hard to find the, you know, the composition or the form that you're looking for to bloom maybe in the middle of the season or between, you know, two native plants. So it's kind of fills in those little blocks. So it's kind of my um, reasoning for using both. And, um, and then here, so, um, you know, we like to, we've both experienced a lot of nature and been out in the wild and prairies and uh, different areas in the Midwest since we're so lucky to be right in the middle of it and have such great natives to use. And so, you know, going out there and for example, up here, the Baptisia macrophylla, those are such a beautiful individual specimen. And when you see them in the prairie, generally, you, they're kind of dotted throughout and they're not just like in a big thick mass, like you would see the lower plant, the Monarda fistulosa, that kind of grows in a colony. And that's just like an expansive, um, you know, and kind of has these beautiful swaths going through a meadow or a prairie that you'll see in nature. So kind of using those techniques that you see in nature and doing it in your design is a great way to kind of emulate nature and know how to use that plant. And it doesn't always necessarily have to be that way where, you know, if you're wanting to use more diversity and you know, rain it in, you don't have to use the Monarda fistulosa in huge blocks of 20 by 20. So you can definitely put smaller groups of three or five. And um, yeah, and but it's just a great resource to go out and see how they are growing and know that for you and, and know that maybe the Monarda fistulosa is going to be a little more aggressive and send out runners and kind of like to create colonies. So you don't want to put it next to something that's a little bit more aggressive or less aggressive, and it would kind of swallow it up. And eat it in the future and you wouldn't have that plant. So just kind of putting it next to maybe a grass that will kind of stop that, the crown will stop that plant from expanding too much or that can be a part of the editing. Um, and, um, and yeah, and so like, you know, and I, we're not necessarily, these plants don't all maybe are, aren't gonna grow on a bluff together or in this glade or in a certain specific spot, you know, have these cer certain, um, niches and but they're definitely native plants that like the same cultural requirements and will do well together and so the mixes that we created might not be the exact combination that they'd be in nature but we um, try to use things that have a similar 
needs and like you know we have part shade combinations uh, we have a wetter area that tolerates more moisture and heavier clay soil maybe more aggregate in some of the soil for free draining so we kind of took all that into consideration when creating these combinations um so scaling up or down like i previously mentioned a lot of people see these gorgeous gardens um, at a lot of nurseries and um, and these naturalistic style plantings. And it's just really hard to digest them and think about how can you narrow that in or make it bigger for a larger space. So um, we this is a great example. And so we used like smaller quantities, smaller groups for the residential scale and um, using larger groupings kind of helps with the aesthetics because a lot of people aren't ready for this like super wild looking even though some of us might really get excited to have that wilderness look to it and make it look really natural um, the aesthetics really aren't there for a lot of clients yet and if they are great but a lot of people want to see a little bit more neat and tidiness because of the formality that everybody is so used to and so um, we kind of this has to be a gateway to getting to that more natural look and so if you use larger groupings and not do onesies and twosies of things and do more five, seven, nine, then that's going to create more of a substance and um, more of an impact than having it floating everywhere. But as you can see in this picture, having the liatris dotted through is nice with the other larger clumps kind of help bring it all together and hold that combination and not make it look super, super wild. Um, and super aggressive plants might not work. Um, so we, when we, you know, Jen will talk more about the how we came up with the list, but um, the aggressive plants might do better in a larger corporate campus setting where they can kind of do their thing. And if they end up getting a little bit bigger than you expected them to, great. But um, they, that just in a more residential scale, putting something like a physostegia that's going to kind of run or maybe. Um, an artificialosa, unless you really are there to edit and depending on how much maintenance you are having available to you, um, it's better to have a plant um, that is kind of a little more well behaved, I would say. Um, and if you do want to add those plants, like say like something that is a self seeder and seeds quite a bit, add that later into the design, maybe in your third year, second or third year, once all of the kind of ground cover layer and masses of plants that you have already in the design. Once those have filled in and suppressed the weeds and filled in, you can start adding that stuff and it won't be as aggressive if you add it later in the future, like coneflower or maybe this um, Euphorbia corallata um, is a good option. Yeah, so just talking, kind of reiterating what Austin said, you know, the process, you know, we're how, how we went about um, starting our plant lists and our plant combinations, you know, again, starting with thinking about plans that maybe um, are not as aggressive that, that maybe you would use on a larger scale. Like, you know, we, we didn't really use many silphiums, for instance, you know, the compass plant or, or, or um, prairie dock or things like that, because those are on the, on mostly on these scales, they, they would get pretty aggressive, kind of flop over things like that. So on larger scales, you know, or cup plant, for instance, we didn't use. Um, or physostegia or big blue stem, um, kind of staying away from those more aggressive plants because we're trying to kind of create a composition. Um, but the first steps were kind of Austin and I just sort of discussing um, plant combinations. You know, we, we just threw ideas out there and then we bounce ideas back and forth like, oh, that might be a little more aggressive or maybe it's not sandy enough for the site or, you know, whatever. And then we would then, um, once we kind of nailed down our compositions for all these all these combinations for all our different scales, we would then um, assign percentages and then can kind of consider um, the composition in the landscape. So, so you know, for instance, a sedge or, or a, a, a shorter grass, like a June grass or something, maybe that was kind of a matrix planting, but then you had kind of punctuation within the landscape would be like the, the liatris from the previous slide or even Echinacea pallida. Um, this slide here, you know, you see GM triplorum, um, prairie smoke, which is a very early season interest, usually kind of an edge plant, uh, but then it sort of goes away, you know, maybe June or something like that. You know, you still, still see the basil leaves, but you want something to take its place. So maybe it's interplanted with spirobolus um, 
and and and, and even shooting stars or deck at the end uh, to, to kind of give that early season interest. But then when it goes away, you have something to kind of take its place. Um, it's all about the seasonality, you know. As as you know, I mean, there's there's a long season to this, and then when you get into the kind of the fall, the, you know, the fall color and, and things like that. So um, there was a lot of back and forth with kind of coming up with the plant list, thinking about seasonality and composition placement in the landscape, you know, whether it's kind of a matrix species, um, a colonizer, um, something that's going to reseed aggressively. And then we would assign percentages to these species, um, which would then spit out a number at the end of how many we had of each, assuming we did pl uh, pints or, 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 or um, plugs or gallons, and um, and then laid that out in the field. We can kind of go into that later. But um, that was kind of the, the initial process and kind of a lot of back and forth. And so not everything was really dialed in on paper. It was a lot of just creating the lists and kind of doing a lot of field adjustments. Here's uh, two examples of some plants we talked about before that kind of go well together and are good in the landscape. You know, Echinacea palata, the, the flower on the left, and then Sporobolis, uh, prairie drops, you're familiar to, these two probably familiar to a lot of people. Um, but again, you kind of have this this height with not uh, with the echinacea with not a, a huge basal area where you could interplant that in amongst um, sporobolus where it kind of poke out above and then when those seed heads kind of or when when it's done flowering then then you get the seed heads in the in their late summer or early early fall of the sporobolus and you still have your winter and, and uh, winter interest with the seed heads of the echinacea along with the color of the sporobolus as well. Yeah, and so this process that we did is a very unconventional kind of uh, design process that you would typically see, you know, most designs you would have written down on a piece of paper and then you'd have it drawn out and, you know, we would probably pass it back and forth. But we thought since Jens lives in Madison, Wisconsin, and I live in Chicago, and um, we know our plants really well, we thought this would be a great chance to um, so like he said, we got an Excel spreadsheet and we kind of had the three residential areas, three mid-sized gardens, three corporate campus, and then came up with those plant lists and um, kind of did it based on percentages and made sure that that seasonality was, and the composition was um, figured out for each group or plant community that we chose. And so, and you know, that seasonality definitely comes into play with the textures of the foliage, you know, different tones of green and blue and different grass uh, textures. And the um, seed heads are really important, like the Agosta key, like that still is there through the fall and winter. And that structure is so prominent and with a bed of grass surrounding it is just, that's all you really need in, in a garden and it's beautiful and people enjoy it. And uh, people learn to enjoy it if you, educate your clients on how, you know, the gardens work. I think it's really important to talk to them about the seed heads and, you know, the color of brown and how gorgeous the, uh, you know, winter tones are and, and um, how that all works together to create seasonality. And, um, and then also how important ephemerals are. A lot of people forget about um, really early spring blooming perennials like GM triflorum. Um, they even bloom before a lot of bulbs bloom. And um, so the ephemerals add a lot of amazing texture in the spring. It's like people are so excited to see something in the garden. So that fresh green um, basal foliage, and then it helps extend your season, adding that color. And so having those dotted through the landscape, you don't need to have the whole ground covered with ephemerals. But if you, I mean, if you did, that'd be great. But um, if you want to just add, say, even five uh, mertensia dotted throughout, and then um, you know, putting them in a special location next to a warm season grass, such as like little blue stem, Shizakirium, Scoparium, um, you know, grasses that come up a little bit later might not come up till June, having something there to have interest and kind of detract from the um, grass that hasn't come up yet is a great way to add that, you know, extra dimension, extra layer to the landscape that your clients will really appreciate. And so, um, you know, Dodecathion and Sporobolus is a gorgeous combination. Jen's talked about that he loves. And, you know, those big tussets of, um, you know, that you see in the spring of the burn down or the cut back um, Sporobolus and then having that new green hair emerge from the um, 
plant and then having those cute little shooting stars popping up through that is a special moment in the garden. And then I have a few examples on the next slide. The, that's the shooting star I was talking about. So, you know, it's more, you know, of a woodland species, but if you have it in your prairies and it gets covered up later, you know, it has, you know, it works in those full sun situations as long as it gets some, you know, shade from the other plants um, after. And then the Mertensia is really a magical plant. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to grow it, but it literally just pops out of nowhere and the new fresh leaves are like a purple uh, raspberry color. And then they just like all of a sudden it's 18 inches tall the next morning when you wake up and then the buds are there um, and the buds are kind of a, you know, soft pink uh, fuchsia color. And then they kind of have different tones of white and blue and purple, you know, because they seed around a little bit. And then they literally disappear once the season kicks off into June. Once that blue little blue stem starts going, these ephemerals kind of melt, literally melt, because I always think I'm going to find out, you know, when I'm going to go back and see when it, you know, goes away and what time. And then you just forget about it because everything else is going and it just kind of melts away. And so it's a great addition to any garden and important, I think, to add. Yeah, so we sort of talked about this a little bit already, but the percentages and quantities, again, a slightly different kind of process, but I guess Austin and I have just done this many times. So, so we're able to kind of do this remotely, go back and forth on percentages and, and quantities, and then, and then kind of use our, our, Experience and instinct to kind of lay those out. And again, those three elements we talked about, the plant habit, you know, is it more aggressive? If it's more aggressive, you know, smaller percentages, obviously, less aggressive, larger percentage. And then also kind of the matrix of it, you know, is it a, is it is it is it, is it the underlying matrix or is it um, kind of something we really want to highlight? You know, a lot of these gardens were existing, um, so they had a lot of that sprobolus in it already. And we thinned some of that sprobolus out, some of it left. Um, so we, um, we decided to kind of um, include some of that as a matrix, but then kind of added our, our, our species in there. Um, and then, yeah, kind of the impact desire, you know, do we want it to be really showy, um, you know, individual species or as a more colonizer as well. Um, and, you know, again, just using the square footage and assuming 12 to 15 inch spacing, um, that's just, especially for plugs, uh, you're gonna want that because otherwise there's just too many opportunities for weeds to come in. You know, we're not using mulch in these gardens. These are just they're so tight that, that mulch is not necessary and it would just sort of get in the way. Um, and, you know, so, so we don't, and we don't really wanna see mulch, you know, we wanna see the plants, you know, this is not the typical design gardens where you have space between plants. Um, you know, that's not necessarily everybody's style, but that's kind of what we're doing, you kind of have to do. Um, also the 12 inch spacing, I guess, makes for easy math for uh, figuring out figuring out your percentages and, and um, how many plants you need. Yeah, so, and then um, kind of talking about the different categories that we placed the plants in when we were trying to make sure that we selected um, kind of from each group to have the right composition and flow. Um, and I just want to make a note that, you know, when you're cre creating these percentages, depending on your availability of the plant material and, you know, Midwest Natural Garden natives, they come from plugs, you know, they have the landscape plugs to a pint size, you know, 10 uh, trays of pint size and gallons. So, you know, depending if your plant is, in, you know, more of a plug versus a gallon, you're going to need more plants for plugs you know, depending on how fast that grows. So um, if you, you know, had 2% of Baptisia in your garden, you're going to want to add a few more in plugs than you would typically do because you want them to be, you know, because they're very slower growing and, um, and you want to make sure that they come up in your composition. And so they're kind of broken up into these different groups. I do like individual plants. So this is something that has kind of got a presence and it's um, kind of a standout and kind of a season seasonal like firework that comes off and kind of just adds that little bit of touch like a liatris, um, ag ag agastiki, ag agast yeah, a lot of people say it in different ways, but um, that's a great one. It's got a beautiful kind of candelabra form. And then the Baptisia leucantha has got the beautiful flowering stems. 
um, spires. And so that's a nice vertical form going through the garden. And then the next one we talk about is blue, a block or group planting, which is more of a mass. So like the Monarda fistulosa, that's in large colonies, larger groups, like groups of 15, uh, you know, seven, nine, 15. And these are plants that kind of have more of a colony cultural um, habit that they, you know, kind of have rhizomes. They grow uh, like pycnanthemum, you know, kind of does the same thing. They all knit together. So that's a great plant to use for a group or a mass planting. And you probably wouldn't want to use them too much as an individual plant. And um, then the matrix is, so most of these plantings, I would say like 75% of the plantings are matrix plantings. And that means that they, you know, we put all the block and the individual in and then any of the empty space in between, which about 60% of the planting area is going to be the mix of grasses, either into like a one species or multiple species um, of grasses. So like some examples, Sporobolus heterolepis, the Schizocurium and Budalua curtipendula and Carex rosea were our main Carex, our matrixes that we used in the plantings. And that's a great ground cover layer. And so you have all these beautiful seasonal plants that are blooming in the masses and individuals. And then having this tapestry of grasses running through and connecting everything together, I think is really important. And I love that look because the softness of the seed heads and the, the uh, texture and the, you know, the flowing of the, the grasses in the wind kind of give you that quiet space in between the blocks of Monarda and um, kind of elevate and make the individual plants like a gas to keep glow when they're surrounded by grasses that aren't really competing for the attention, you might say. And then a scatter plant is similar to an individual plant, but they're more, um, you know, on a design, I'll just say, oh, I have a scatter plant of Monarda punctata, which we have pictures of in the coming sides. And this is something that you would kind of dot around and it's just kind of a little sprinkle plant that you pop around. It doesn't really take up a ton of space or, um, yeah, they're just, they, uh, they just sprinkle around and you can kind of throw them a little bit everywhere and put them with something that you think it'll be a nice accent with. So we'll go over a few combinations that we created. So the, this is a residential planting scale that we did. Um, this is a part shade to sun combination. And the matrix that we used here, the main ground cover layer was Carex rosea. So we've got that ground cover in the spring because it stays semi evergreen and, um, and doesn't really need cut back necessarily um, until later every, once everything fills in. And so that kind of suppresses a lot of the weeds in the spring. And then we've got the groups of Eurbia macrophylla. So you can see in the background, the aster. Um, and we have those in groups of like seven and nine because those are another kind of colony plant that kind of grow better together in groups. And then the Lobelia syphilitica we have for those beautiful spires that come up in, later in the season. And the Carex muscingumensis is the palm sedge. And I love the texture of that. So it's just a little bit larger grass. And we have that kind of um, drifting through between the um, block, blocks of the perennials. And then the individual scatter plants that we have kind of dotted through are the Mertensia um, virginica, which is the ephemeral that I talked about. And so that's for our early season color. And then Allium cernum. And so those, you know, little balls of Allium blooming in the summer, popping up through the Carex rosea is just a nice delicate touch and add an extra layer to the garden. And the Zizia aria is a beautiful spring umbellifer. And so having all these different forms is really important when you're thinking of these compositions. So we have the umbellifer, which is the flat top of the um, Zizia aria. We've got the spire of the uh, Lobelia. And then we've got kind of the moundy, roundy of the Yerby uh, aster. And um, so that kind of one of our combinations. Yeah, so moving on to the mid-size combinations, these are the these are little larger gardens. And then also uh, on the mid-size, we went with maybe also a little bit taller species, maybe plants that are a little more on the aggressive side or kind of more like, quote unquote, as Austin said, adventurous. Um, some of which would be um, 
the, the vernonia, which is not really shown in this in this photo, but the, uh, the iron weed, which can get can get very tall, but it's very interesting kind of individual plants um, that that can be in groups. And then the you know scattered plants, the parthenium. Um, these these were uh, I think all the mid-sized ones were definitely full sun too. So these are all full sun species, as you can kind of tell by the list. Um, and then groups of the sprobilis that we were working with that we had existing, we sort of thinned out some. Uh, the panicum switchgrass, um, which is a nice kind of accent plant, but again, pretty aggressive. So we had to kind of be, be careful with that one. Um, Monarda punctata, you can kind of see in the foreground in this photo, it's got the stacked flowers, um, some of which um, are starting to kind of brown out. Um, same um, same kind of flower structures, Monarda uh, fistulosa, just sort of stacked, very interesting plant. It actually does really well on very sandy sites, or gravelly sites, uh, Tritoscantia, um, you know, a, a, another nice uh, kind of individual scatter plant, GM triflorum, which we talked about before, um, Eryngium yuccifolium, rattlesnake master, a lot of people probably recognize very, uh, there's sort of one off to the to the side in that photo, um, to the right, upper upper right, uh, very interesting habits. Um, um, so again, these, I, I would say we're getting more towards, the mid scale is definitely much different than the residential scale. It's, it's more of a wilder, I guess, look, but still controlled, I guess, to some extent. Um, uh, and then, you know, moving up to the corporate campus scale, you can see our um, um, some of the species here were, that, that we went with. You know, we, we had uh, Eurebia, like uh, Astra macrophylla, used to be Astra macrophylla, um, you can see in the foreground here. A nice late, late blooming flower, but also has a um, Basil leaf is very interesting. It takes up a lot of space and um, has large leaves, according to you know, uh, like the name says. Um, the groups Monarda fistulosa, uh, sneezeweed, helenium, um, Coreopsis palmata. So definitely more species, more on the aggressive side. Um, Schizoscarium, Budalua for grasses, and some of the scattered plants being Parthenium. Again, you know we use Parthenium a lot of scales here. I think it can be used on on, on, on different scales and. Um, uh, Echinacea pallida too. Uh, we also did in in the we had one area that uh, one of our corporate camp, quote unquote corporate campus scale was um, pretty wet. So we actually put in some angelica, which is kind of an interesting interesting plant to use in a landscape setting like this. And it came up. I mean, it it, it didn't really show itself yet this year. But um, I mean, you know, we didn't get the big seed head on it. Um, as much, but I think this year it'll it, it'll be a very interesting um, addition to to a combination like this. Not a plant that's typically used in um, in a setting like this, I don't think, but really an interesting plant when you see it in the landscape, when you see it in floodplains or or fens. Um, definitely one to to try to emulate. So, so that that was a fun fun one to throw in. Um, yeah, and this. This combination, you know, you see the Yerbia, we used it in the residential and the large scale. And so the residential, we used five to seven uh, per, per group. And then out here in the resident or in the corporate campus, we used, you know, you can use anywhere from 15 to however big you want to make it, but 15 to 25, say, is kind of the grouping that we made just to show a bigger presence because it's a larger space to kind of um, make it less messy, wild looking. Yeah, so um, just talk about, you know, when we started laying out. So, of course, um, all of my gardens, I'm on site to lay out because they're all hand drawn and there's always field adjustments, we call them. And it's important to be on site to be able to, you know, because we know the plants, we created this masterpiece art piece that we want to, you know, it to be successful. And so we know the competition and the way the plants um, work together. And so I can't imagine how hard it would be uh, for somebody else to lay it out um, if they aren't familiar with the style. And so um, I just kind of wanted to talk about, you know, we lay out, there's kind of a path that I use to lay out the garden. So like when Jens and I were both there and we were starting on a new like residential scale garden, um, it's important for me, I think, to lay out the individual plants first. So the ones that are maybe like a panicum, you're going to have that kind of dotted throughout or the Agastache or Baptisia, having those laid out first to kind of anchor the planting is important is the first layer that I would do. And then start adding in the masses or the group, um, the groups next. So then you start putting in the larger 
um, group plantings. And then after that, then kind of sprinkling those scatter plants around is the third uh, layout that we would do. And so we would sit there, you know, we would talk about, oh, this is going to, you know, this Monarda punctata is going to look great coming out of the Sporobolus. And so we would kind of scatter those throughout and the, some of the empty spaces. And then lastly, then you put in the matrix grass that you chose or, and it's not always a grass, but mostly it's usually a grass um, with the matrix. And so you take that matrix and then any of the spaces that are left over, that's when you start filling in um, with all the grasses that you have. So that's kind of my layout or the way we laid out the gardens. And yeah, and so we always discussed them and it was interesting to go back and forth and, you know, Jen's would be like, oh, I think this one, you know, might be a little bit aggressive for this. So we should put this next to it to kind of control it. And um, so I think that collaboration yeah. with a contractor or landscape architect uh, between the two of them, I think that communication is really important to understand the artistry and to have that collaboration and having the designer come on site and be there to lay out the garden to kind of fulfill what they were hired for. I would think. My yeah, I mean, there's so much is just sort of in, in our head and kind of instinctual when we're on site. It's a little hard to describe, but like we do, you just get a feel for it when you when you start to do it. I mean, you have your lists, but, you, but, but since we don't have individual plants or individual even groups of plants, established on paper, uh, the, the field layout is, is is very important for that. Yeah. So just some notes on, and maybe some photos here on installation. On this photo, you can see um, one of the existing gardens that, th this was actually one of the corporate scale. If you've been to Midwest Natural Garden before, you probably noticed the sign, this is right off the road. Um, these were mostly kind of spirobolus beds. You can see the tufts of spirobolus there that we started with, this was after they were burned and we edited out some of these because, you know, as most of you know, those, those, those are put on a lot of, on a lot of growth and, and, and do take up a lot of space. So, so they don't look like much now, but later in the season. So we, so we edit those out. So, but we, we do like sprabbles a lot, but they were just little sprabbles heavy. So we had to kind of edit some of that out. So we planned around that. So that just gives you a flavor for some of the stuff we were inheriting when we started. Um, here, here's another look. Uh, there's the sign kind of off to the left. Um, so it's looking at a different view, but this is the Sparables a little later in the season. So you can see how we kind of laid these out. One of our shade gardens is actually, you know, as you probably guessed, in the, in, in the shade under these trees, but the front edge of this bed is actually part of the corporate campus. These, um, our bed lines are very kind of sweeping. This is kind of a big C that sort of wraps around to the front. Um, but again, just to give you kind of a flavor of of what we were, we, we were dealing with. A lot of these flags that we put out were sort of delineations or borders between the different zones to kind of give, give the crew we were working with an idea of where to start. And then we also had paths going through some of these areas too. So we had different colors for paths or bed, bed lines. Yeah, and we came out and we sprayed, we sprayed out, sorry if you didn't mention, if you mentioned this, but we sprayed the, you know, cause there was a solid mass of sprobolus. And so we came out with spray paint and sprayed out the large areas that we wanted removed to have space for the block plants and the individual plants. And so you can see this is after that process was fulfilled and we um, got that all removed and then came in and laid out those larger groups. So, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. Um, so here's, here's kind of a shot of, this is one of the residential kind of part shade gardens, um, one of the smaller ones. And you can get, a, get an idea, you know, we, we have a larger plant material for for this garden and that just had to do with some of the species we were, we were working with. But you can kind of see the groups we sort of laid it out with, you know, there's some Eurebia here in the foreground and then, you know, some of the sedge we were working with. Um, so the initial kind of process to get those kind of blocks in and then we kind of put the matrix in amongst that later um, as we go. So this is the initial kind of layout process. And yeah, just another shot of obviously we're at Midwest you know, we have a lot of plants at our disposal here. So, I mean, the plants were just there. Um, so it was pretty easy to get them over and then work with the crew and used augers, um, just these gas power augers, which are definitely the tool you want to use a uh, two inch bit for, for plugs and, and a larger like four inch bit for um, pints or up to a gallon, you can kind of make a bigger hole, but um, you sort of lay them out and they just 
pretty fast process. And again, you're, you're not using mulch. You're not having to go back and mulch later. If you wanted to, you could use mulch to begin with. Um, I've, I've done it that way, very thin. You put it down over the prepped bed and then kind of drill right into that. But on this scale and with, um, you know, we I typically don't do that, um, but you, on this scale and then with um, the density we were going with, that was definitely the way to go. And even if you did do mulch, you wouldn't re-mulch these areas because they, they do fill in. So yeah. collaboration and action, right? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so here we're you know filling in, it's the same garden that we showed earlier. And so having that repetition, I wanna say is really important. So having at least three or five groups of those group plantings to kind of lead your eye throughout that specific part of the season is really important and not just having, you know, one area of just the one plant unless it's an individual or a big, you know, like a specimen tree, like an amelanch here is a great way to like ground planting. And then, but I think it's that repetition is a really important key. And then right now we're filling in with the matrix Carex rosia and all of the empty spaces between the groups and the um, individual plants. And the maintenance here is really, it, um, we have there's a in-house maintenance staff for all of the Midwest gardens and then um, Enrique, the, um, the manager at Natural Garden Natives does a lot of the maintenance here and is very well trained, knows his, gar knows his plants really well so that I mean, we couldn't ask for a better garden stewardship in these gardens. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's roughly about, between all of the 11 gardens, there's around 10 or 11,000 plants that we used. Yeah, and then. Just like a video and, where are we doing the video? Okay, well, yeah, here's some shots. These are probably Austin's photos, so he can describe. Them. Oh, no, yeah, so this is the, you know, we showed it before, but this is the final product after. So we installed these gardens, like the first week of May of 2020. Um, you know, so we were excited to get out of the house and be social distance and uh, laying out gardens and very fortunate in our industry. And, um, and then, so this is kind of the magic, literally four months after this picture, three to four months. So what the power of plants can do to a space. And that's, this is one of our residential um, final products and it'll even look better this year. So it's very exciting. Yeah, these gardens, like Austin, I mean, they're, they're four months old and, and, and they look great. I mean, it has, has to do with you know, we had obviously very good plant material. We had good plants, people to work with, as Austin mentioned at, at Midwest. Um, but these are living things. They will continue to evolve and will continue to edit out species that maybe are too aggressive too, if, you know, it's, it, it's still is gardening so we can kind of control or try to control as best we can and push it in the direction we want it to go. So I would say with these gardens, especially the biggest thing that we don't, tend to do is talk about the after fact after the garden is installed. Um, you know, you're not, you're, you're not really done with the process. So I think informing your client beforehand that you will need to come back two, three, four times, you know, especially that following year to assess things, make sure there's no red flags and that the balance of plants is correct. You might find like in this garden, in this video, you can see the the Budalua curtipendula, you know, it's like, okay, well, that is, you know, maybe a little bit too strong. And you can find that out once the other plants start growing and filling in. And so that editing factor is a really important uh, part of the design process as well and coming back and kind of um, getting that balance. And so telling your client that and making sure that the weeding is on schedule and that it's done at appropriate times, you know, in the early spring, getting on it before you know, it gets too late and they need to be hand pulled or worse that the garden needs to be totally replanted because it's been taken over by weeds and has seeded and uh, been a disaster. So that maintenance is so important and, you know, try not to, you know, we all want to get the project, but it's important for the longevity and not to forget that the gardens still exist after we install them. And, and we were going to talk about the, um, so the, the maintenance of the gardens after the winter, we burn them. You can either burn these areas or you, uh, we cut them back with a mulching lawnmower. And so mowing over them, you know, with a blade four or five inches high, and then going over them four or five times to make sure that the debris that, you know, that has kind of gotten fragile over the winter has all broken up. And then that is the 
kind of the ground cover layer and the food for the soil for the plants and it helps suppress the weeds until the plants kind of fill in again that leaf litter. Um, so there's really no outputs or inputs. It's all kind of a closed system. And yeah, and it's, um, it seems to be a great, you know, method and uh, easy and then, you know, shearing everything down. And, but of course, there's some plants that are really large that it's hard to mow down, like maybe some panicums or yeah. uh, maybe a large baptisia, but those you can easily go in there and do a little bit of trimming. But generally, that's kind of the practices that I use. Yeah, and like it, leaving things in the winter, I think is key. I mean, typically, I mean, it depends on the site, but typically leaving things up in the fall and winter for that winter interest, you know, they get covered by snow. There's, and also for uh, food for um, for insects or birds that, you know, the, the non-migratory birds, um, you get stalks of echinacea or, or liatris or something like that. So we typically leave them up in the fall through the winter and then do that burn and or clean up um, later. The shade gardens, we probably wouldn't burn, but the rest of them, Definitely could burn. Yeah. And um, and then I just want to mention the you know the plant list. We're working on those, and we had a few questions that we need to go out in the field yet this spring. And so um, those the percentages that we used for these plant mixes and combinations, um, those are going to be up on the Midwest Ground Covers website. And so you can see the mixes. And like I said, you don't have to do you know if you it's a great resource. So if you come and see the gardens, it's great to kind of maybe pick from two different combinations and make your own combination, or you can select the combination that we created and use the exact percentage for the square footage that you need um, and have them delivered and lay them out the way you want to lay them out. I think that it's, a, it's just a great resource to go and see these plants in action, how we group them, what they're doing in the ground instead of reading it out of a book, I think is really how I learn is being in the garden, growing, revisiting gardens, seeing nature and um, just 11 plants. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, we do have a fair amount of questions we're gonna try and get to. We're probably gonna go past um, 11 o'clock central time. So hopefully you can hang with us while we try and get through those. We will, um, on the last slide, we have Jen's and Austin's contact information as well if we don't get to your question and want to email them directly. Um, so I just wanted to mention, if you are in the Chicago area and want to visit the Midwest Natural Garden, um, it is a production nursery, so it's not open to the public, but these gardens are kind of at the front of the property. So our customers and industry professionals are welcome to visit these gardens, as well as the Carrick's classrooms, classroom that is also on this property, um, or you can also contact your salesperson for a professional tour. So as Austin mentioned, we've got those plant lists up on our website. Please check that out. Um, I just want to say now again, before we get into the questions, remember, if you need CEUs, there will be an email coming after this. You need to do the quiz that is attached on there within 24 hours. And um, also, we're, this is the first of a webinar series next week, a Friday at the same time, um, will be Roy Diblick on why old plants can be new again. So join us for that. So um, getting into the questions, you guys, there were several questions about bed prep, um, what you did on this site, what you would do on other sites, whether it was a, you know, a, a disturbed site or in this case like you were you know trying to keep some of the plants so can you speak to that a little bit yeah this site we had i, I guess i'll go um we had the, some plants we, we saved um like the sprobulus we mentioned um but that was just in some of the beds some of them we kind of started started from scratch and and so they, they were um there were some herbicide put down on um some of the beds and actually some of the bed lines actually came out a little further so they took out some turf grass just manually and again you know we had uh midwest personnel there um but if you had like a turf area that, that you wanted to convert into something like this yeah you could simply just spray paint out your area um if you wanted to manually remove remove this the turf or the sod that's fine or you could just use some herbicide and then you could plant directly into that kind of dead turf um you know with the auger it, it, it works really well um, it's, you know, very site specific, but here that's, you know, we, we, we had a relatively clean site to work with. I mean, we had plants people there every day, so. 
And I think it's best to not disturb the soil as much as you, you know, can try not to. So I think the crew did a great job of removing what we wanted removed um, and not, you know, bringing in big tractors and kind of com compacting the soil and mixing up the soil and bringing up that seed bank that maybe is hasn't been awoken underneath there. And so that's just going to add more weeding for you. And so, like Jen said, a lot of times I don't do any um, amendments to my soil. I like to do like, you know, if it is an exposed soil because there was something existing, it's good to put a few inches of, um, you know, compost or um, like a really fine pine fines before you plant and then lay the plants out and then dig through that uh, layer. And then that helps kind of suppress some of those weeds in that first few weeks before it fills in. Hope that helps. All right, so then at the beginning, we also had a couple questions about Monarda Austin. Um, so does Monarda fistulosa spread fast like other Monardas or does it clump? And um, what about Monarda bradburiana? So I love Monarda bradburiana, I'm obsessed with it. And I think it's just like a special, you know, it blooms earlier in the season. It's a spring bloomer and other typical Monardas are summer bloomers. So Monarda, and it's a little bit you know, smaller, mildew resistant and uh, likes dry sun. And so that's just a great plant in, to add into, especially residential, it's perfect for residential. And I think Monarda fistulosa probably lends itself more to a corporate campus or mid-sized gardens and Monarda bradburiana is more residential. And like I said, it just has that different time of year. It's more of a spring flowering plant. And yeah, the I would say fistulosa is maybe a little more aggressive than the, a lot of the cultivars. Uh, like I like to use raspberry wine and uh, Claire Grace, but I think like the fistulosa seeds around and um, and runs. So it's just a very tough plant. So if you have the maintenance there and, um, or if you have a really large space, that's a great use for it. But some of the other ones are a little bit slower um, to um, spread. And some of the cultivars also provide longer blooming season season as well and why that's why I like to use them and the colors. All right um another we have several questions about mowing uh the timing on the mowing and also how this affects um you know pollinators that are overwintering in the plants. Yeah I mean how it affects pollinators is going to be very specific to the species of pollinators you may have um you know if you have certain species like um uh, carnival butterfly, which I, I deal a lot with. I mean, in Illinois, it's not that common, but in Wisconsin, um, we have very specific protocol and timing we deal with. Um, so that, that's going to be very specific to, to the pollinators you work with or other species like uh, ground nesting birds. Now, you know, the, the, you're probably not going to affect ground nesting birds in, in April because they won't really be arriving yet. But um, any, you know, hopefully, you know, you take those things into account. So it's going to be very specific to those um, those species, but in terms of mowing early in the spring, I mean, you know, for burning, you know, we, we, we like to say we can, we burn anytime between November and April when there's not snow on the ground. So whenever we can fit it in, but still taking into account other species, other pollinators and catering um, to that, you know, use leaving some refugia. If you have a big enough site, sometimes you like, you like to leave some refugia. That's not really on a garden scale. It's kind of larger, multiple acre, acre scale, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be site specific. And I think I like to like with my residential gardens, uh, I always tell my clients that do it themselves or you know whoever does it. Um, it's usually late February, early March. It all depends if there's snow cover, but it's usually like a dry, crisp day. You know, and it doesn't have to be exactly, but you know the ground is still frozen. So when you're mowing over the gardens, you're not you know hurting anything or compacting the soil. So that kind of dry, crisp air, kind of you know, and so the plants aren't like damp and wet. So you want the plants to kind of be dried out. The you know, the spent foliage, and then so it mulches up nice. And, um, and what was the other part I wanted to mention? Yeah, I think that was it. Did we get everything for that one? Yeah, the timing. All right, we've also had a few questions about, um, I guess, in the chemical realm. So um, do you, I would say, probably in this project, we did not use um, chemical control. I actually, I don't remember, so you guys should answer that. Did we use chemical control? Do you guys use it on your own? What about pre-emergence? Can you talk about that? I don't think there were chemicals used on this. 
Um, but like Jen said, in my gardens, I typically like, you know, for, you know, time and money, the, you know, we generally we will spray um, once, spray the grass with um, some form of Roundup. And I know nobody likes to hear that, but one, you know, if you do one spraying of a diluted Roundup and you don't use it again, and so it's, um, just important to kill the turf and that actually is kind of protecting the soil and the aggregates of the soil and then you can drill right into that and that kind of helps suppress the weeds that dead grass layer and that's kind of my process. Yeah, agree. And you know, we, we didn't use and nor have I really used pre-emergence. I don't have much experience with them, but you, you know, the pre-emergence obviously they last, different ones last different periods of time. Uh, but we want these things to reseed. So pre-emergence would, in theory, if timed at the right time, would also prevent our seeds from, from, uh, from germinating uh, the, the beneficial plants. And do we use herbicides? Yeah, we do on larger scales, especially because that's really the only, you know, if you're working on a thousand acre site and you're doing spotted nap weed control or something, I mean, that's really the only way you can cover ground. But, you know, we, um, you know, it's, it's, it's used at a, at a much diluted quantity compared to, you know, other, other industries or adjacent industries. Yeah, and I haven't heard of any like organic way or, you know, like not using, you know, a truckload of cardboard and how you can find that, um, you know, to kill the grass. Like if there's other ways and you have- Like put tarps down or something. Yeah, I mean, people yeah, have done that. Months, like, months, yeah, there, kill, then that's fine. But, there are other ways you could, you could try to go about it, but um, yeah. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys, we have a ton of questions. So I'm trying to hit on some of the bigger points. Um, I guess uh, there have been several about. Um, so in this project, we used all, you know, finished either plugs, pints or gallons, but there are questions about when do you use seed mixes versus plugs? Well, I guess I can do that. Um, seed typically on a larger scale where you have sort of less control, you know, I mean, if you think about, you put a plant there, it's, it's going to be there. Obviously, it's going to, uh, it's going to reproduce over time and, and species are going to move around across your site. But with seed, you have less control. Now, sure, you could, you could separate out individual species and sprinkle them in, them in, but they're still going to move around and it's going to have more of a wild look. Um, so on a larger scale, you're going to use seeds. Um, you know, you could seed an acre for, you know, you get an acre of, of a decent seed mix for, you know, 1500 dollars or something. Whereas if you're plugging uh, an acre, you know, that's 43,000 plants. So just do the math. I mean, it's like incredibly more expensive, but um, so usually when you get to larger scales, or let's say you had a large scale and you wanted certain areas of the site to have very controlled look. So you put your plugs in a few thousand square feet, but then in amongst that you seed also, and then beyond that edge or your controlled edge, you have seeded areas. So you kind of get the best of both worlds, hopefully. Um, I think it's 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 a cost thing. I mean, sure, if you have a client that wants to put in forty thousand plugs, great. But um, you know, it's at, at at some point, like the cost is going to determine whether or not you go to seed versus plugs. You know, I work on very large scales, often you know, hundreds of acres or thousands. You know, we're not plugging that. Obviously, we're putting down seed, and the seed also gives you more. You're not irrigating the seed typically. You're just letting sort of nature figure itself out, which is great. It's usually lower maintenance and less because um, it's a larger scale, but again, you don't have that controlled look. So I think the aesthetics are a little bit different. All right, and then we'll get to a few plant specific questions and then I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, could you chat about using Carex pennsylvanica versus Carex rosea as a matrix plant? I mean, we use both. Um, we like rosea. Uh, I, th I think in the partial shade, we like rose. I mean, Carex Pennsylvania is pretty, um, pretty versatile. Um, I use both. I kind of use them sort of interchangeably. I don't know, Austin, do you have further? Yeah, I know like, you know, rosea is great and it's really lush really early in the spring and kind of the, like, like, I don't know, kind of chartreuse just kind of, and it's a little bit more compact, I would say, and not as maybe wild. So if you wanted like a more neater look, I think maybe that, is you know when it first comes up, but then once it goes to seed, it splays open. So it's not the most attractive thing um, when that happens. I think I mean I'm pretty sure you can correct me if I'm wrong. But and then it grows up through that and has the new foliage after it seeds. So if you don't mind that look, that's fine. But you know I don't think Pennsylvania goes through that phase. And I also love albicans as another 
um, great substitute for uh, Pennsylvanica. It doesn't brown out in the summer on the drought. And uh, Bromoides is another great one if you have a little bit more moisture. Um, so there's so many great ones out there. And your muscogamensis that you, we had, you know, we had in the partial shade, I mean, but yeah. It's not as aggressive then. Yeah. All right. Um, and then a couple questions on pycnanthemum. So is pycnanthemum very aggressive in a garden setting? And um, is there a better or best pycnanthemum for a dry, sunny site? Um, I think, you know, like I would say like Vir Virginianum, I can't remember. I always get the two like uh, tenuifolium and Virginianum mixed up. There's one of them is like a little bit more like controllable. And then the other one, you know, runs a little bit more. And then, you know, like I use Pygnanthema muticum and that is a very quick, you know, runner. But if you can manage that size, um, you can do that. So, you know, I love, yeah, but that's a non-native. So, and uh, the flexuosum is a really great one. That's probably the least aggressive flexuosum. It's a non-native, but that's, yeah. Um. Oh, and then there was a uh, any any shrubs you use in your designs? Yeah, we did have some shrubs. We had like Coralis. Um, we had um, Ceanothus, Ceanothus, uh, New Jersey tea, and uh, we use Lindera. occasionally we use Roos or Lindera. Um, some some viburnums here or there. You know, it's more of like a woodland. You know, trilobal maybe or black haw or something like that. Um, yeah, no, we definitely use shrubs occasionally. Yeah, so like dotting those through to kind of, you know, we had an area where we just wanted to kind of have a division or a little bit of screening. So that's why we use the Lindera and the Ceanothus. And then, you know, I like to use like open form, like behind there's behind us there, we have a, a Cersus. And so that's kind of a nice multi-stem if you want to have a small uh, tree. Uh, yeah, so just something with an open, more natural feeling habit, habit is a great shrub that I like to use, whether it's native or non-native, witch hazels, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and the lank ears. There's just lots of great options. Um, okay, a couple questions about um, deer and rabbits. So, can you, yeah, I think in natives in general, but also in this garden, any issues with that? Yeah, I mean, deer browse can always be an issue. Um, in my mind, like, yeah, the, the rabbits are going to browse your shrubs pretty heavy, um, typically. Deer browse is tough. I mean, um, you can use like a plant skid, like a blood meal to try to keep them off. Um, I think if you have a large enough site, hopefully there's enough other things to eat where they don't just, you know, um, destroy everything. But, um, you know, I mean, like for instance, like deer eat a lot of native orchids. So if you're looking for orchids, I mean, they, they, they eat those. So, um, if there's just a lot of deer, heavy deer density in your area, that just might be something you have to kind of kind of deal with and, and, and try to be creative and uh, get some coyotes. Off, get some coyotes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think like the importance, you know, these gardens and gardens I create, we create the diversity is really important. If you have a garden of roses and hostas, you're gonna you're just welcoming the deer. And so if you have things mixed with them like allium and calamantha and pycnanthemum, things that have a minty taste or a sour taste you know, within, you know, they have to kind of pick through the buffet. And I think it's better to have that. And I, I haven't really had any issues with either one of these in any of my gardens. And I just, and it could be where they're sited, but I think if you have that diversity, it's, you know, they're maybe more likely to go to your neighbor that has, you know, a palette of- lettuce. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the diversity, I mean, they're not gonna necessarily like everything. So they're, they're not just gonna go through and pick. They're, they're just gonna go after those hostas. So, so yeah, send them to your neighbors who have the hostas in the rows. All right, and then I think this is gonna, we're gonna do this as the last question. Like I said, I'm sorry, we got so many questions. I, I apologize for not getting to all of them, but please, you know, um, if you have specific questions for Austin and Jens, you have their emails there. So please uh, uh, contact them and, and they'd be happy to chat with you. So um, last question we're gonna do is, would you say the gardens you've created are lower maintenance than a typical landscape or do they have higher maintenance requirements? I mean, I guess I would lower, but, you know, the more kind of specialized, 
knowledge to maintain. I mean, um, there still is maintenance and I think there still is that editing and kind of controlling of the landscape and that, that you would do on any site or any kind of garden. But I think, I still think a little, a little lower, you know, you're not remulching these things. You're not putting down pre-emergent herbicides. You're not necessarily uh -huh, um, yeah. having space between the plants where you're gonna replace individual specimens, you know. These things will reproduce eventually on their own and move around and be more long lived. So in the long term, especially. Yeah, and I think you know, based on I always think of like you know what my client's budget is, and if they're going to be taking care of the garden, who's going to be taking care of the garden? What is their knowledge? You know, if it's more specialized, like if it's at a botanic garden or a estate garden or something that is you know high visibility and they have the money to do it, then my gardens are more complex. They're more of a matrix, they're more mixing, there's more species in it. And then if it's something that I know they're just not going to take care of it, but they want a garden and they, you know, they want the low maintenance, then, you know, smaller palette of plants. And I pick things that are very, you know, that don't need any extra water, drought tolerant. It all just depends on the site and the client. And I try to make that balance. But yeah, I would say my, my gardens, our gardens are definitely lower maintenance than the typical uh, landscape because we're not doing any deadheading, remulching, um, watering, staking, um, any extra work. I know, you know, it's like I like to walk around with a glass of wine, enjoy the garden instead of being in it all the time and like hacking out all of the things that you don't want in it. But I think it's, yeah, it's, yeah, like my parents' garden has been um, in for 12 years and it's been watered four times in 10 years. So it's just picking the right plants and um and the right community and growing your own plants and trying it out so hopefully that helps thank you so much for coming everybody it was fun yeah, thanks it was good enjoy yes it. thank you so much for joining us everyone like i said we have um the webinar next week with roy diblick and the following week um will be carla patterson lynch so um join us the next couple of fridays at 10 a.m central time and uh, we look we look forward to seeing you. Have a good one. Okay. Bye.